I put every Navy SEAL on a pedestal. It's easy to do. It's easy to do. You read the books about them, you see movies about them, superhuman. But what happens is, once you drop your own limitations, and you, so one thing we do bad in life is we put all these people above you. Never put anybody above you, man. Make it an even playing field. But you can't make it an even playing field if you're not working your fucking ass off. I'm not saying not to respect people. You gotta respect people. But if you're playing tennis, right now there's tennis going on here in Queens. If you're playing tennis and you're playing Roger Federer, even Roger Federer is not here right now, let's say you're playing Roger, Roger best ever. All you be best ever. But I'm fucking good at tennis. But Roger's the best ever. That's in my fucking head. And we're playing a five set match, Grand Slam. Before Roger serves the ball, the first serve of the game, first serve, set one, game one, first serve. In your mind, you're thinking, man, that's the best fucking person in the world to serve. This is how I thought about Navy SEALs. So what happens is, two sets fly by. Roger fucking smokes you, 6060, or 6061. You're like, wow, man. I can play with this motherfucker. But by the time you realize you can play with Roger Federer, it's too late. It's too late. So that's what I mean by that. Don't go into any competition of life, physical, mental, emotional, whatever it may be, too late. You gotta try so hard. Know that, know that you've worked hard, hard as fuck, to be on an even playing field. So I did that. So once I did that, your eyes open up. So, I, so now you don't see Roger Federer as Roger Federer. You see him as a fucking tennis player. So now you're competing on the first serve. So you give yourself a chance to win. So when I went to Navy SEAL training after my first hell week, second hell week, third hell week, I was like, man, I can compete with these guys. Not only compete with them, I'm going to go another level. Because I started seeing, I put these guys and a lot of people on a pedestal but it also hurt me it hurt me too because when you put people on a pedestal you expect people to be at a certain level so I was living off of wow all these mythologies of what a special forces guy is you get up you don't sleep you run on broken legs you know you I mean, it's like you know I really fed into all that shit man so it actually helped make me who I am but I start looking around, seeing, man, these are really a lot of them are normal fucking guys. And that disappointed me, but it shouldn't have. My expectations were of myself. I was grouping everybody. So that's where I realized being uncommon amongst the uncommon is really about yourself. It's you against yourself. It's not you against them. But it kind of, it sounds like that because really these guys are uncommon. Once you become a Navy SEAL or whatever you become, a big CEO, you're now common again. So everybody looks at these guys as uncommon. But once you become one, we're all guys again. We're all in the same group of guys. We're all in the same fraternity. So how do you separate yourself from the best? I talk about the repetition in my book a lot. Yeah. Got to get the reps in. So now my conversation is this. I never set out to write a book. When I was in the dungeon and no one was coming back to help me, I just wanted that reflection in that accountability mirror that I hated so badly to be something that gave me pride, to be something that made me feel. It wasn't about, it's not about money. It's not about success. It's not about people. Oh my God, that's David Goggins. Sign my book. No. When I started this journey out years ago, it was about, I just want to learn to read. So now I'm at a place wow. now where I see the possibilities of the human, of human potential. What are we capable of is the conversation now. The conversation now is how can I now talk to people in a way they can understand the message that I have for so many people. So that's the, that's the new conversation now is that I, you are constantly evolving. You never stay, either you're getting better or you're getting worse, not staying the same. So for me, I have to constantly be getting better. I have to constantly be evolving my message. So I'm constantly thinking in the quietness of my mind. That's, that's a key point too. The world is so fast paced. 
the world is so noisy. So my conversation now a lot of times is, my God, slow down. The world can take you here, here, be here, be there, be everywhere. And I lose myself sometimes. So I catch myself in the airport. I catch myself in the plane while I'm writing stuff down. Okay, remember this, remember that. And I'm like, hey, hang on a second, God. What, what got you here? This isn't what got you here. Slow the fuck down. Go back to the quiet place of that dirty mirror in that $7 a month place you used to live in. That's where you grew. You, so I, so that's what I'm, I'm constantly reminding myself go back to your roots. Now I'm not saying go back to hell. But I'm saying don't forget where you come from as you start to explode out of the gate when you become someone. My conversation is do not forget your roots. Do not forget your roots. Don't let this become so big that you lose yourself amongst the noise. Go back to the quietness of what made you successful. That's the conversation now. It's a constant reminder of that. That's where you find yourself. You find yourself when you are the when you're not comfortable. When you're not comfortable on a daily basis. And that's how I started to grow. Like I said about the mind, it wants to put you in that nice 72 degree temperature with, with everything right there. It wants to be in that nice with a little massage therapist. That's where your mind wants to be. It doesn't want to be, we're going to talk about Hell Week. So it doesn't want to be in Hell Week. In Hell Week, I, I was in three of them. I finished two of them in one year. Only person to ever do that in still history. There's been people who, you know, who have gone through a couple of hell weeks, but in like five years, six years, seven years, eight years. I did, I was in three in one year. They say it takes off three to five years of your life. So hell week is 130 hours of continuous training. You might get two hours of sleep. And what it does is, it's designed to break a man. To break a man down to the parts where, like I talk about the surface, how it's fixing the surface. If you only fix the surface, you will never get through hell. Because what it does, it starts to bring out these demons. Because even though there's a lot of yelling and stuff like that, there's times where it's very peaceful in a very eerie way. So the first hour of the 130 is breakout. The shooting gun is loud, it's noisy, your mind is in chaos. When your mind's in chaos, you can't think. So you're having fun. Yeah, this is great. Yeah, we're in hell. We're Navy SEALs. We're trying to be Navy SEALs. We're badasses. Then what they do, and I don't even think that they understand what they're doing, but I studied the mind. It's perfect. It's psychological warfare. They go from an hour, the first hour, when you're going crazy. The second hour of the 130, they put you in the cold water. It's called surf torture. Now they don't call it surf torture because it's a kinder, gentler word. It's called surf acclimation. Put you out there. No one's quit. It's only been an hour. Maybe a couple of guys have. And you're in the Pacific Ocean, which is never warm. You're all linked arms. You're sitting there, and the waves are crashing over you. I went through winter hell weeks, which is cold. The Pacific Ocean is like 50 degrees. It was 49 this particular night in my third hell week. And what it does is it makes your mind flip out. We've been doing this now for three weeks, being in this water. But for some reason now, the water is colder than it's ever been. It's not. Our minds are fragile. We can process a day. It's hard to process 130 hours. There's no end. There's no end. So the mind starts to ramp up. So you're sitting there, it's quiet. No one's yelling at you. You hear the ocean. Shh, shh. And you're freezing. And your mind goes spastic starts to think, I have another 129 hours. You're not going home, you get yelled at, you can be frozen. So you panic, you freak out, and you want to quit. What I realized about the mind is those people who can be in that time and embrace that time and be in that moment and not allow the mind to go to 129 hours on hour one. It's a control that we don't have in our minds. It's a control that you had to have for three months when you're miserable, when you're suffering, when you're laying on the floor, when you're doing all the disciplines it takes to be a monk. You cannot think about 
the whole process. It will make you, it, it will, it will make you so insanely crazy. It's impossible. It's inhumane what I'm about to do to myself. You have to be able to break all these big, humongous, painful things in life down to the smallest molecule. That's all the brain can handle. The brain can't handle hours and hours and hours of suffering, but it can handle. Right now, I'm in the Pacific Ocean, and it's very cold, and this is what I'm doing. Don't think about the rest of it. So that's what I learned from Hell Week. That's what I learned from being in three Hell Weeks. That's what I learned from all the military. I went to Ranger School. I went to all these different schools to learn all of that, to learn how the mind processes. So I, I talk about theorists. I talk about practitioners. A theorist is a person who reads a book, doesn't do it, reads a book, learns about something, and then talks about it. A practitioner is myself. A practitioner is a person like me. I wanted to be an expert in the mind, a mental toughness guy, beyond mental toughness. The only way to do that, in my eyes, is to put yourself in hell. Put in hell repeatedly, repeatedly put yourself in hell, and study how you process it. And that's how I was able to come up with all these different ways, all these different tools to to slow the mind down in hell, because the mind just speeds up. The mind wants to get out of the painful situation, the suffering. It can't it can't process it. So that's what I realized by going through all these different processes of being in hell weeks. Uh, there, there's some times where the mind gets overwhelmed, and you cannot slow it down. But by these these certain tools I developed, by not allowing your mind to get away from the moment, you cannot. You have to think about the exact moment that you're in. But I saw when I was younger, the moment became too big. When it became too big, I spazzed out and I would quit. But now I don't think about even like an hour from now I'll be eating. I don't even go there. Because then your mind, yeah, oh no, we must embrace this because now. There's, you have to be a leader in this moment. It's not about you just getting through it. I had six guys, I had five guys, and six including me, in my boat crew. Now it's the boat crew leader. So now, another trick is this: if you don't think about yourself, there's no pain, which can also lead to pain later on in your life. But in these moments when you're struggling, if you are a true leader and you're worried about your men or women beside you, your mind doesn't care how cold you are. Your mind's only worried about taking care of the men and women beside you. So I started realizing, man, if I take care of these cats to my left and my right in the worst moments, my mind is no longer thinking about you're miserable, David Goggins. Get the hell out of here! You think about how was John, how was Andy, how was Sam, how was Pete? How hey, how you guys doing? You're not thinking about me. So there's so many things you can do to get outside your own head to then allow your body to just be like, hey, we're just a machine. But you have to let your mind be able to process all these different tactics. Do that. Take a different vantage point in life. When you are in the hell, you can't see the beauty of being in it when you're in it. Get on top of that mountain top in your mind. Get on top of that mountain top and look down at what you're doing. You can see a whole different world, and that world is beautiful. But you got to get a different vantage point in this in the suck. Don't be in it. Spiritually, get out of it. Get that soul. Look down on what you're doing. Be amazed by the process of where you're at now and where you came from. And I looked at my shit was this is the perfect training ground to being a man. Hmm. You know, a lot of people, like I was talking about taking the path of least resistance. I believe in life you must earn the right to be called a man. And a lot of people do not think the way I do, and that's fine. I'm not asking to be David Goggins. Trust me, it's a hard fucking world to hold. It's not <laughs> fun. Like it. It's not fun all the time. But the thing about it is, you have to look. I, I looked at my hardships as challenges. Once I got over the pity party, because I went through that phase. Of course. I'm a normal human being, but I realized that that got me exactly where I was at. Even worse, as I looked at those challenges the way most people do, woe is me. Why the fuck can't I get a break? Why I wish I was better. I wish my parents were better. I wish I had a better education. I wish this. I wish that. They have all these wish sandwiches. I started realizing 
how can I fucking figure out how this shit can fucking work for me? So the one thing we don't do is we don't, when we're in that dark place, that dark place is a great learning environment. If you can sit back in a dark place and find quiet to just think, there's so much power in your failures, in your fucking, in, in your suffering. Because why? You're still alive. You're still fucking here. So you gotta look at that shit as my God, man, this is power, man. Like, now I gotta flip this shit. How many men would be able to do what I'm about to do, what I'm about to try to do? Like, literally, what gave me strength was when I was at the worst of my worst, how many men would even fucking say they wanna try to be a Navy SEAL right now? I'm at the worst spot of my life. Like, I can't even walk down the street, let alone run down the street. And I'm gonna now call a recruiter up and try to be a SEAL. There's a lot of power in that. But people don't see it there. They see it, man, that's stupid. I had this voice in the back of my head that I kept on running from. I was afraid of water. I was afraid of dealing with things that made me feel unaccepted. Mm. I didn't accept myself. So I kept on going towards things that I felt good. Let me, let me go this way. But something kept on saying, motherfucker, you, you have it, man. You got it, man. But you're going to have to fail a lot. But you have it. And like I said, that, that voice kept on haunting, but that voice kept on saying, if you face it, you realize it's not that bad. I said, I'm tired of feeling the way I feel every day. I'm tired of how I feel, I'm tired of lying to myself, lying to people and just being some piece of shit. And I always knew in the back of my mind, I could be something special, but I knew the work it was gonna take was gonna kill me. I was afraid of that. Mm. I was afraid of the brutality and the suffering I was going to have to endure. Mm -hmm. But I knew, I knew I could do something. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, I ain't trying to do that kind of work, man. What got me to this point was I was just the opposite of what I am today. I was that guy who ran away from absolutely everything that I got in front of me. But not many people knew that. Like the real me was like this very scared, insecure, stuttering, got beat up by his dad, all this kind of stuff. First of all, you have to start your journey. And many of us think because we're born into this world that we have started our journey. It's not it, man. That's not it, it's not that simple. I wish it was that simple. Many people have died and lived to be 100 fucking years old and never started their journey. That journey starts when you start to meet yourself at that battle. When you start to battle yourself and start to break down those walls that you in society start to build in your own mind. Once you start to break down those walls, you've now started your journey. Mm -hmm. Your journey has to be hard at first. I couldn't run. The first thing about it was, so I said to myself, I'm gonna run four miles. My first run out the gate, I'm gonna run four miles. I ran a mile, I, I ran a quarter of a mile, walked home, sat on the couch, depressed. I said, man, there's no way I can do this. But what, what I realized, though, is I wasn't going to give up. Because I'd already given up many times. And I thought about how would I feel at 50 years old if I gave up now. I mean, not to have, you know, so I kept all this stuff in my mind. Basically, I started becoming obsessed. I slowly, it didn't happen that night on the couch. Right. Over a period of time, I started becoming obsessed with studying, with weight, with being somebody, with making people who thought it was gonna be nothing, kind of like, feel like shit. I became obsessed with, you have to make this right. And the only person you can do is yourself. So I became obsessed with just being obsessed. The reason why we go back to old habits is because our goals are too lofty. We're not achieving our goals fast enough. So what happens is, you know what, oh man, we're very impatient nowadays. For me, it was good. I didn't have a phone. I was, I was, I was out of this world by myself. It was a race against David Goggins. It wasn't a race against God. I don't look good for this person or that person. It was me. I got to change myself. So for me, if I lost five pounds in a week, I got a feeling. I allowed myself to feel proud of that. I didn't look. I got to lose 106 pounds. I'm like, man, I went from 297, now I'm 292. In one week, man, I'm, I'm killing it. We don't, we're not proud of ourselves for the small accomplishments. 
what we need is we need this monstrosity of the thing to happen say ah I did it nah there's a process that you have to go through and patience is the process and if you don't have patience after a week I haven't lost 30 pounds and I'm done I'm over it so that's what I found out with people man they're not patient enough to realize and to enjoy the moment not live in it just enjoy it there's no finish line in life but enjoy that moment roger that man I lost five let me go ten next week so that's the whole thing about it that's how people lose it it starts with yourself man you gotta start diving into those things that you are afraid of you don't gain confidence by going to the spot that makes you feel good it's gonna be a false reality and the second life gives you that challenge all you want to do is go back to what made you confidence or, 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 or what gave you confidence is that happy spot no what gives you confidence what gave me confidence was spending years at a kitchen table trying to learn how to read and write on my own realizing I can't learn the way you learn I can't but I can learn what gives you confidence not being afraid is overcoming the fear I used to stutter severely bad. So right now, I don't know how many people are going to watch this. You know what gives me confidence? Is that I no longer care <laughs> if I sit and start stuttering to you. Yeah. That's what gives me confidence. It's facing these things, overcoming them. And maybe not overcoming them every day, but facing them. And facing them and facing them. Pretty soon like this, you know what, man? This is where it's at. It's not in that comfort zone. It's in the discomfort zone is where my confidence is getting built. Mm -hmm. That's where it's getting built. But people want to, they want an easier answer. Yeah. There has to be an easier way. There's not. I'm sorry. I searched for it my entire life. <laughs> you cheated, I did. You lied. I lied. I did everything. And I still felt empty. Mm -hmm. I coach a lot of people nowadays, billionaires, who call me on the phone and say, man, I'm still missing something. It's because they did what they were good at. And they had this beautiful family two, three houses, cars, everything. Has everything to work. On the outside looking in, like, my God, man, how can you be unhappy? I walk around with a backpack with all my stuff in it. Right, and no right, car. Right. And I walk around, happiest person in the world. Have nothing. Happy as hell. It's because I found out the whole key to life. It's not in all that. You have to face yourself. So many people live to be 100 years old and they die miserable having everything because they never examined. I call it my live autopsy. Hmm. You never examine this. Happiness, peace, enlightenment, it's all up here, man. It's all up here. If I start talking like this, people go, man, you know, uh, no, no, it's the truth, man. Yeah, it is true. It's yeah. all up here. <laughs> you just gotta be willing to go and face it. And that's the hard part. Uh, I saw a rocky trend in the movie, but I see what I went through in real life. That, that movie's a fraction. That, all those movies I watched that inspired me, they're all fractions of the real work I put into my life. And I don't ever talk about it enough. The amount of work I put into being who I am, I don't have enough time in the fucking day. Like, I don't talk about it, I don't, I don't brag about it. it. No one even knows about it. Like 99.9% .9 of the shit I did to get to where I'm at today was alone. Mm. Alone. Out there running in cold, in heat, suffering in pools, trying to swim. At home in a fucking room by myself, trying to teach myself how to read and write, how to study. You know, no one saw that shit. There was no video camera, there was no podcast, there was no Who's David Goggins. It was me, I just, just for me trying to get in the military, which everybody can do, it's easy. Just trying to learn how to read and write was something that blows Rocky away. So all these different challenges that I've been through in my life, I, I've, I've easily, you know, I don't, I don't look at that movie the same way because I'm, I, I'm, I'm proud of what I created, but I'm more proud of what I created without an audience without a cheering squad, 
without someone like you know, like you run the Boston Marathon and people love that race. They run so fast because for 26.2 miles, there's a motherfucker just, come on, man, you got it, you can do it. You know who you are when there's no motherfucker out there when you're running. And you're at mile 75 or 150 mile race, ain't nobody cheering for you. You're broken, you're fucking defeated. It's you and you alone in your fucking head. And I stayed that way for the better part of 30 fucking years trying to figure this shit out and once you figure it out you look at your everybody say, hey so you're all broken now you know is that how you want to be yep if you can feel if i could put my brain in your fucking head you said the same fucking thing you would no longer think i was fucking crazy you no longer think i was sadistic you realize motherfucker this guy found it There has to be something so deep in you that drives you. So what, what really does it for me is I know what we're capable of. And I know that most human beings aren't willing to go where I am. And that's a very, very dangerous thing. I'm not saying I'm better than anybody else. Everybody has this talent. It's not a talent. It's just realizing that we stop way short of our true potential. So through my life, I realize these things. And I know what gives me fuel is I know that most people who are blessed with so much talent, great parents, great upbringing, didn't come from where I come from. They're going to quit before me. Having all the tools that they have, they didn't have the ability to examine themselves. When you have everything so nice in life, it's, it's great to have a great life. But what happens is you don't self-examine. You don't do a live autopsy. When you have a fucked up life, it almost forces you to do a live autopsy. It forces you to find strength from places that no one looks from. Because food is not at the ready. You know, you're me, I have a learning disability. It's not at the ready. I can't just pick up a book and start reading. Right, right. There's, there's preparation behind everything I fucking do. There's, there's, everything I do has to come with so much fucking preparation. It's despicable, it makes me sick. My own personal life makes me sick. That's why I'm so disciplined now. Without my self-discipline, there is no David Goggins. Mm. Like, I can't like, stop reading. I won't be able to read tomorrow. It will, I will lose it that fast. You know, I, you know, I cannot stop going to the gym. My mind is set up in a spot where, hey, the second I stop, it wants to stop. Because I had a quitting mind growing up. When you get beat the shit out of you all the time, your mind wants to go to that nice spot where you're comforted where you're not trying, where shit is easy. That's where your mind, it doesn't want to think. You have all these things in the mind and, and the mind can only absorb so much shit. So all the pain that has to go through, it, does, it wants to push it away and say, let's not do that. So every day I'm fighting where the mind wants to go. So it's a, it's a, it's a, constant, it's a constant evolution, man. Fear in life is that there is a final resting place in this world and there's a final judgment and you talk to something much bigger than you. I don't want to sit down and have a conversation with someone with something that says you're in heaven this is what you should have been on earth and are you really in heaven now or are you in hell? Thinking about how much I left on the table for fear for not willing to go over the wall and over the next wall and over the next wall so in my mind, I believe that, and God knows all, at least I believe that. I want God to be up there right now as we're speaking, writing stuff down, saying, my God, he exceeded even my expectations. Wow. That's how I live my life. I now know that there is no cap on the human mind. There's no cap. We cap it ourselves. of us are going through fucking hell. Maybe not as bad as me, maybe worse than me. Sure. But they don't know how to express it because we're supposed to live in a fucking world where we have to talk a certain way. We have to walk a certain way. We have to act a certain way. A kind of general world. Nothing gets handled in that fucking world. You stay fucked up in that world. You stay in a world of things will get better because someone said they would and I need to find peace. No, 
You need to go to fucking war with yourself, man. At the end of that fucking war, you'll sit back all damaged and bruised and scarred up and fucked up, and maybe your so ass muscles so tight that you may lose two inches on your fucking body. Who knows? But then that fucking war, you're gonna sit back on a couch, maybe have a fucking glass of water, drink a beer, drink a beer. The war may be 30 fucking years, but when it ends, you will know what the fuck it's all about then. And then you'll find your fucking peace. You'll find your fucking peace then. But until then, you'll always be searching to find that nice, kind book that guides you beyond all your personal suffering and shit. That miracles your fucking ass to peace. <laughs> it doesn't happen, man. Maybe it does for some people, but you're just scratching the surface of real life.